Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host. Welcome to this special classic episode of the Church Leaders Podcast. Today we're featuring the most downloaded show in Church Leaders Podcast history. In nearly 100 episodes, this is the most downloaded and most talked about show since we launched. In our discussion, we talk with Dr. Kara Powell. She's the executive director of the Fuller Youth Institute. She's a youth expert, and uh, she discusses some groundbreaking research on why young adults leave the church and the things that really make them stick. Um, Some incredible research that goes into this, and it's a valuable episode, so important to the future of the church. Um, So the answers, like I said, they're surprising, they're practical. You're going to get so much out of this episode. Let's jump right in right now to this talk with Dr. Kara Powell. Kara, welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast. It is so great to have you today. Thanks so much for making the time to be with us. Oh, my pleasure. Looking forward to a great conversation. For sure. And I want to tell you this, that content that deals with why students leave their faith, what makes them drift away, and also what keeps them engaged in the church has been some of the most viral content on Church Leaders since launch. So I cannot wait to kind of unpack uh, some of the research that you've done and talk about these issues and uh, share that with our leaders. Let me start out with a big question first. How has youth ministry changed over the last decade? Can you give us a big sweeping picture of that? Yeah, great question. Well, at its core, I think youth ministry is really about um, helping students understand the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And normally, and I I certainly recommend that that is done through incarnational ministry, through adults embodying Jesus in the flesh as they interact with uh, young people. So that hasn't changed. I, I think what has changed in the last few decades is there's been a professionalization of youth ministry. And on the one hand, that's really wonderful. We have more youth ministry majors. We have more young adults and adults who feel committed and called to youth ministry for the long term. We have more churches hiring youth leaders. There's so much good that has come from that. The downside of it, though, is that a lot of churches then feel like they can outsource the spiritual formation of their young people to that professional, whether that person is, you know, five hours a week or 40 hours a week, or volunteer youth leader who is supposed to kind of shepherd the young people. Um, And so as a result, churches have moved away from investing themselves in the lives of young people. So we have this growing canyon between, say, a congregation and a youth ministry. Um, And one of the ways that we've seen that that's toxic to young people's faith in our research is that of all the youth group participation variables that we've seen, being involved in intergenerational worship and relationships was one of the variables most highly correlated to young people's faith. So in other words, while it's great that there are better trained, more called, more specialized, paid and volunteer youth leaders, the downside is that the gap between the overall congregation and the youth ministry is growing, which ends up being toxic to young people's faith. Wow. Now that's a huge point. For sure. And I think uh, just reiterating that, so it's the actual chasm that's getting bigger. So we're getting more professional, but more separated and segregated. Does that summarize that a little bit? Yeah, that's exactly it, Brian. So as a result, young people graduate from a a youth ministry. They graduate from high school at, at grade 12. And all they know is the youth ministry. All they know is the youth leader. They don't know their church. They don't know adults in their church. So no wonder they end up drifting from the church because they feel like they've graduated out of it. They don't even know the church. Really good research indicates that almost half of young people drift from God and the church after they graduate. And as a mom and a leader and a follower of Jesus, I'm not satisfied with that. Brian, I know you're not satisfied with that. The leaders listening to his podcast are not satisfied with that. And so that's why we at the Fuller Youth Institute have tried to figure out what churches and leaders and families can do to give young people a faith that lasts, or what we call sticky faith. I think that's a great definition. We want students and young adults in this generation to have a sticky faith. And those statistics are staggering to think about 40 to 50% of graduates when they go off to college drift away from their faith. We need to fight that with every fiber of our being. So give us a little bit of an example of how do we bridge that gap in the church? What does it look like to do that? Yeah, well, one of the privileges I have at working here at the Fuller Youth Institute is we get to walk alongside amazing churches who are diving into our Sticky Faith online resources, who are diving into our Sticky Faith cohorts. And so we get to learn from their creativity and their entrepreneurial ideas. And many of the churches that we're tracking with make some of the greatest intergenerational progress by what we call the five-to-one ratio. 
And this is really a term that my friend and colleague, Chuck Clark, here at Fuller coined. And it's this idea that so often in children's ministry or youth ministry, we think about we need one adult for every five kids. Well, what we're saying at the Fuller Youth Institute, or FYI, is what if we reverse that? What if we have a new ratio that isn't one adult for five kids, but it's five adults for each kid? Five adults who know a kid's name, who are praying for that kid, who are showing up at soccer or hockey matches, who are going to Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts events, who are seeing that kid at that piano recital or in that school play. And so what's been so marvelous is to see churches really creatively either through the church or by empowering parents, say, okay, how can each kid surrounded by what we call in our family, the Powell family, you know, that team of adults, who's on your team? Well, that's powerful. And it is to flip that paradigm and think about five adults to one student. I'm sure there's many youth pastors out there right now thinking, wow, how would I do that? How would I make that happen? Um, You know, trying to pull in just a couple. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that, Brian. The good news is we're not saying every kid needs five Bible study leaders. You know, (laughs) the average youth pastor is having a hard enough time recruiting one adult for five kids, let alone, okay, now five Bible study leaders, five small group leaders for each kid. No, 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 no. We are talking about adults who simply show an interest in a kid. So let me give you an example just from yesterday. Um, Our daughter, Krista, our middle child, is turning 13 in a few months, and because of our Sticky Faith research, we thought, gosh, what a wonderful time as she's transitioning into adolescence, literally becoming a teenager, for her to know the, the five adults who are most on her team. So Dave, my husband, and I talked with Krista, and we said, you know, how about if sometime in the next two months before your birthday, you spend time with five different women, five different women who you look up to, who you want to support you, and, you know, that each of those women share some life advice and spiritual advice with you. And she, she said, great. She rattled off the names of five women. They were the women that David and I thought she would rattle off. And so just yesterday, I sent an email to those five women and said, hey, you know, can you sometime in the next couple months spend a couple hours with Krista, whether you take her grocery shopping with you or take her on a hike? We don't care. But we just want her to know that you are part of her team. Um, which I think illustrates for busy church leaders who feel overwhelmed by trying to create this team of five adults. You know, I, I think often a senior pastor or a youth pastor's best point of leverage is to motivate and equip parents to create that team. Probably the majority of students in a youth ministry have parents who, if they understood why and had some tangible ideas about how, to create that team, they would be able to be point on creating that team for their kids, which leaves the senior pastor, the youth pastor, able to focus on those kids who don't have that kind of parent, and that's where they can devote their energy and create that five-person team around that kind of kid who doesn't have that social capital at home. I love that paradigm shift, and I think it's it's critical if we think that direction for youth ministry, so it's less about kind of staffing this giant, you know, I mean, Bible study group and more about building godly mentors into students. Uh, it's a powerful shift. Uh, so give us an idea of like, how could a, a youth leader start moving in that direction? What are some of the first steps he or she could take to build a youth ministry that's around this kind of five to one model? Well, I would say the very first step is, for a youth leader is to talk to their senior pastor their supervisor, their Christian ed director, their next generation pastor, and explain this vision that they hope that every kid can have five adults who support them. So so that's step one, is getting the vision and support and buy-in from whoever is supervising you. The second step, I would say, is to train parents. Um, and, and that's part of why, especially in this back-to-school season, we at the Foley Youth Institute are offering a number of parent resources that parents can use on their own or youth leaders can use with parents books as well as a, a new five-session video curriculum so that youth leaders can say to parents, hey, here's why you need to build this team and here's how you can build this team. So I would say the first two steps, number one, talk to whoever supervises you. And, and help them explain this, the shift that you're trying to bring about in your ministry. And number two, help parents get on board. And then I would say number three is, is which students in your ministry probably won't have parents who will be able to create that five-person team. Identify those students, talk to those students, and say, hey, you know, what adults do you look up to? 
and then see if you know if you can be the catalyst for the, for the students who don't have parents who create that team for them. See if you can be the catalyst to create that team. And I should say, by the way, while there's some research um, explaining why five people is a good idea, I mean, even just one extra adult or three extra adults in a kid's life is certainly powerful. So if five feels overwhelming, you know, shoot for one or two, and, and you're still ahead of where you were. Yeah, that's a great point. Don't give up because you can't get five. If you get a couple yeah. in there, that's still positive uh, movement in the right direction. Great point. Absolutely. I'd like to go back to that first point, because I think there are many youth pastors out there who are trying to build a vibrant youth ministry, and yet they can't get the senior pastor on board. Uh, what have you learned in your research or through stories um, that you could share with a, a youth pastor who wants to make that transition and get the whole church on board with their youth ministry, including that senior leader? What are some tips you would share with them? Yeah, great question. And, you know, I think it's the advice that I'm going to give is advice that is important for all of us as we think about whoever supervises us. For myself here at Fuller Seminary, for youth pastors, for my husband who's an engineer, um, and that is to know your supervisor's love language, to know your senior pastor's love language. Now, I, I'm adapting the term from Gary Chapman, who you know has talked about love languages, especially in marriage and family, etc. Yeah. What I mean in this context is know what it is that's most meaningful to your supervisor. So, for instance, my senior pastor at my church, uh, what's most meaningful to him is Scripture. And if I'm going to go to him and share vision for something we want to do in our church, I can't go to him with research. I can't go to him with what other churches are doing. I need to go to him with what Scripture has to say about how the faith community... I need to go to him with what God intends the faith community to be like in terms of intergenerational relationships out of Scripture. So that's what I need to do with my senior pastor. Other senior pastors, they love research. So if we know that about our senior pastor, then we need to go to him or her with the kind of research that we at Fuller and others are doing. Other senior pastors love stories. Others love the fact that it will attract new families. Others love um, you know, the, the idea that their church is going to be cutting edge. Others love hearing what other churches are doing. And somehow if, if other noteworthy churches are doing, um, you know, this kind of five to one intergenerational sticky faith ministry, then that rings a bell for that senior pastor. So I would say know what's meaningful to whoever's supervising you and frame the change that you think God intends for your ministry along those lines. Beautiful. No, I think that's a great point and uh, some really good takeaways. I, I can actually hear youth pastors writing down those notes right now. So, um, Yeah, good, good. And, and what I love about that idea and what we've seen and how it works with the churches in our Sticky Faith cohort is that every church and every senior pastor is different. So we need to know what, what's most meaningful in our context. Does our senior pastor love evangelism? Does our senior pastor love discipleship? Does our senior pastor love the idea of growth, depth? whatever it might be, frame the changes that we hope God brings in our ministry in ways that are meaningful to our senior leaders. Awesome. Great stuff. And I think it's probably safe to say we can throw out the love language of physical touch with this one, right? Yeah, just right. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah, I need to be careful. Yeah, we're not talking about like encouraging words and gifts and yes. physical touch and all that. So those are wonderful love languages in a marriage or in a family, but no, I, I won't be doing that with the president of Fuller Seminary. Totally so. joking. Yes. No. Sounds great. Well, hey, let me take a shift a little bit from big picture youth ministry paradigms to like really kind of this granular level of kind of ministering to our students and what that looks yeah. like. And you've done yeah. a lot of excellent work on the issue of doubt and handling yeah. doubt among young adults and students. Um, could you kind of just give us a, a quick picture of, of some positive ways to approach doubt, some negative ways to approach doubt as we're talking through that? I think it's one of the biggest issue where we just don't have oftentimes a safe enough environment for students to really wrestle with their issues and, uh, and I think that's such a huge part of what ministry is all about, is, is dealing with people and the real issues they have. So if you could give us just a little bit of a, a kind of an overview of some of the positive approaches, negative approaches to dealing with doubt in youth ministry. I'm so glad you asked that, Brian, because what our Sticky Faith research is probably most known for is the kind of intergenerational relationships we've been talking about. But when someone asks me, what's the greatest surprise out of your Sticky Faith research, I usually talk about our data related to doubt. And what we've seen in our three-year study of over 500 youth group graduates during their first three years in college is that, first off, doubt is fairly pervasive among young people, but doubt in and of itself isn't a bad thing. 
It's not doubt that is toxic, but it's unexpressed or unexplored doubt which is toxic. What we've seen in our research is when young people have the opportunity to express and explore their doubts, that's actually correlated with greater faith maturity in both high school and college. So as a leader and a parent, this has been very eye-opening to me because I think so often in the church we tend to think that doubt is bad, that doubt reflects a lack of faith. And what we've seen in our research, and, and I would argue there's certainly elements of Scripture that support this as well as some, some wonderful kind of sociological research, is that it's often those tough questions that help God become even more real to us. So, you know, I would say some of the mistakes that people make, um, and, and often as we looked at students, these mistakes happened young in children's ministry. So for children's leaders who are listening or for people who are colleagues of children's leaders, please help them understand this, that often it was about in third or fourth grade when that, that third or fourth grader comes into Sunday school and says, hey, I don't understand, you know, about this fire in our town, or I don't understand about this earthquake that killed hundreds of people in another country. Why would God allow that? And the well-intentioned Sunday school teacher says, you know, shh, we don't ask questions like that about God here. Mm -hmm. And what that third or fourth grader ends up learning is that not only the church can't handle their tough questions, but God can't handle their tough questions. Wow. So the, the toxic messages about doubt start really, really young. So part of what we've seen creative children's and youth and emerging adult and college leaders do is on purpose raise tough questions about what's happening in our world. And to be honest, suffering and, you know, the, the illustrations I just used, the fire in your town or the earthquake that kills hundreds, those are hard to understand why God would allow. Sure. And, and to bring that out into the open, because kids are wondering about those questions. And I would sure rather have them wonder those questions aloud in the context of a faith community than stifle them or wonder them with other friends who don't share our faith. So, you know, I, our vision is that, that churches and youth ministries would be the first place that young people feel like they can go with their tough questions. And a lot of times that starts with the adults, the senior leaders, the youth pastors, being willing to raise their own tough questions when they see people in their church with cancer, when there's, you know, even passages of Scripture that are a little bit hard to understand. Just for us to say, yeah, these are big questions, and I don't always know the answers, but I'm going to keep trying to figure out the answers and keep trying to understand the God who is is bigger than even my toughest question. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think the point you made about not having to have all the answers yeah. is is probably what keeps a lot of us from wanting to enter into those those doubt questions because we feel like we need to keep it together and let them know that we have all the answers when they don't need that. It's like, I love that aspect of journey with them through the answer yeah. and, uh, and along that. I so. And, you know, we tell parents and leaders, your, four of your best words to respond when a young person has a big question is, I don't know, but. I don't know, but how about you, me, uh, you know, you and I, let's get together for coffee and continue to discuss it. I don't know, but I know somebody at our church who loves these kinds of questions. Why don't we meet with her for breakfast and talk to her? I don't know, but here's what I do know about God and how God has been faithful to me in the midst of the suffering that I've personally experienced. Those four words, I don't know, but, I mean, I'll tell you, I've used them with my own kids, especially my teenage kids, and I've certainly used them with young people at our church. Yeah, great phrasing, great words, for sure. And, and so let, let me take a little step farther as well. As we're talking about current events, we're talking about things that are going on right now. I think, you I mean, this generation is so in tune with social media, so they're aware of what's happening. They're engaged in the conversation much more than we were you know, a few decades ago. Um, but is there a line we shouldn't cross as we talk about things like, I mean, race and same-sex marriage, and what are some thoughtful ways or just filters we need to kind of process with that um, as youth leaders as we talk about these issues with our, our students? Well, those are certainly topics that are in the news. And so what I wouldn't want to happen is that young people feel like, well, it's in the news. They talk about it at school. I'm hearing about it on Twitter and Snapchat, but we're not talking about it at church. You know, I think that's, yeah. that, that dichotomy is really dangerous and communicates a not-so-subtle message that the church and my faith is out of touch with the world. So again, you know, I think, I think silence is the worst response. I think the best response is one where we're involving parents, because some of those topics are controversial. We're letting parents know ahead of time we're talking about it. We're letting parents know what we're going to be saying. We're inviting parents to be a part of the conversation if they want to eavesdrop. We're giving parents resources 
to continue the conversation at home or maybe even start the conversation at home before the, the young person comes to the youth ministry. So I would say the, the worst response is to do nothing. The best response is to partner with parents, number one. And number two, one of the themes in our research is that young people tend to do best when they feel like and have, in fact, come to their own decisions. So instead of us saying, you know, the Bible says this, we believe this, et cetera, it's looking at a scripture text together and saying, gosh, what do you think scripture is trying to say here? How does that relate to what we're hearing in the news, et cetera? So really honoring young people's abilities to reason and think themselves, it takes more time for sure. And it's a lot more messy and it's a lot harder work. But what we're seeing in our research is that that hard work is worth it because then young people come to really own um, those conversations and the insights that emerge from those conversations. Yeah, no, I think that's amazing. And and I think back to when I was a youth pastor and it was uh, when Columbine hit and, uh, and, yeah. a, and a wise youth leader, an older youth leader who came to me and said, we have to discuss this today. And, yeah. uh, and I did not have it on my plans. I had a different topic to hit and I might've, you know, I had plans to kind of hit it, you know, I mean, from a, a really, kind of high level, just quick, but he took me aside and just said, Hey, we've got to deal with this. And we did. And it was so critical because that's exactly where our students were. And I love that aspect you said there that we can't be quiet about those things in the church. They have to be able to process them. And if anything, we want to help them process them from a biblical point of view and give them that freedom to do so. And it is messy and it is harder for us because we have to process it ourselves. Right. And it's easier right. not to. Right. Right. So, but I do want to let leaders know who are listening is that, that we don't have to start from scratch in these conversations. So for folks who want to check out stickyfaith.org, we have a host of free resources to help you raise tough questions with young people, to help you partner with parents and train parents, as well as some video and, and books, our, our Can I Ask That curriculum, which is super inexpensive. Churches around the country are using that with young people to process questions like, you know, same-sex issues, like racism, like why would God allow violence, like women in leadership. You know, some of these hot-button issues, Excellent. Um, out of our research, we've tried to take a stance that really honors young people and lets them wrestle with Scripture and come up with their own answers. So for folks who are interested, there's a host of resources on stickyface.org. Love it. And we'll make sure to uh, link in the show notes to all of those things as well, too, to provide that and make it really easy for all our listeners to kind of access those as well, too. And uh, man, this time has gone by so quick, but I totally appreciate the research, the commitment to youth ministry, to students, and to the gospel that you have, Kara, and just the, the freedom you have to share that knowledge with us. And I feel like this time, even though it's been short, has been so valuable, and I appreciate you uh, sharing your heart with us, for sure. Oh, my pleasure. I'm, and may the Lord continue to guide and bless this podcast and your work, as well as the work of every listener. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.